Hello, and welcome to our next episode of Let's Talk About It. We're here to investigate incest and destigmatize childhood sexual crimes. Many people don't want to talk about it. We do. With me today, I'm so excited for my next guest. Her name is Juanita, and she's joining us from Wales. Um, as I've been out on social media, I just wanted to start Juanita with, I, I ran across this post and it just sparked my heart. And I'm going to read that for um, everyone right here. And Juanita posted a very emotional day for me today. I've been to my hometown with a lilac ribbon in my hair. On it, it reads, cherished memory of my soul and childhood. In time, I will be tying it to the school gates where I was abused. But for today, I took a picture from across the way. If you could bring us in, Juanita, to that story and um, let us understand with you what that post was about. It just so moved me and I could tell that was a very moving day for you. So if you could just bring us into that moment. Wow, that's, do you know, at the very last moment, I decided to wear the ribbon. I love it. <laughs> oh, that's it. Matched <laughs> <laughs> and that's the very ribbon, right? That you talk about, and I just it's love the that. Very post. Ribbon, yes. It's the very ribbon. So, yes. So, yeah. So, um, I I was abused by um, the headmaster of the prime of my primary school. Um, so, I think you might have a different name for it there, um, but. Um, from sort of three upwards up to 11, 10, 11. Um, wow. So I used to wear, so I used to wear a lil lilac ribbon in my hair and it was partly seeing, um, what are they called? Loud fence, loud fence do um, where they tie ribbons to Oh um, right, churches, institutions, yeah, but they're mainly churches. Not not all churches, but mainly churches. But um, so it was partly from their idea, but then it just sparked me remembering about the lilac ribbon. And then I wrote, I just, I just wrote on it, in cherished memory of my stolen childhood, and I signed it JP, um, like I would have done in school in my school books JP, and yeah, so, and also so went you... on it. The, your abuse started at three years old in that school? Between three and five. I can't actually, yeah. I can't say that I specifically remember the age, um, but between three and five. Yes. Yeah. And so what, abuse. Right. So what, what did, what did the, it was the headmaster you said, and what did his grooming look like then? You know, you're a little, you're a small child. He's an authoritarian yeah. figure. What what kind of grooming yeah. did he give you in those early years? Uh, so just full of praise. Everyone would have said that he was, um, you know, so so brilliant with the children, so mm -hmm. amazing with the children. He's always got so, so much time for them. Very involved with um, one with the school where he was at, but he really embedded himself into society around that. So it's a little small village there that I went to school in and I'm rural where I am. So, you know, sparsely populated anyway. Uh, and um, I feel like I lost my threads with that. It's okay. So, oh, did so he, he would just, you know, keep going. He, yeah. Fine. So he embedded himself in with everyone. So he just made him. So, so he used for me, he used music as a tool to mm. get access to me. So he used to do all the music lessons. So he was a music teacher. He was also very involved with the church. And I think he probably abused, even though I don't know about anybody else abused by him, but I'm sure that um, there would be and that he would use any way that he can. A Welsh speaker as well. So, Right. You, so, yeah, so he brought you that. into, I notice um, a lot that they bring us into this secret world with them. So in these music lessons, did you feel very special to him and he, you had this? So this was the time that he created then to abuse you during these lessons? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so it started off with abuse in the school and then actually being abused in the school. And then that progressed over time to then coming to give me music lessons at home. So then he was coming to my home address as well. 
and then just became very involved with my family um he'd use sweets as well he'd give like so he'd always have sweets in the back of the car and I just it's yeah horrible horrible memories but he'd give us a flake that I always remember I defiantly will buy a flake now and again I don't know if you have a flake there but just a certain chocolate bar um but I couldn't even in a few years we just and you still get triggered with that memory but right I hopefully I've flipped it a bit whereas before I couldn't even just you know just want to throw up at the thought of it um but now yeah it's like sometimes I'll just buy one of those like in defiance <laughs> yeah you know I I understand that the association right is repulsive yeah you know and yeah. I love that you use the word vile because it is vile and so this abuse continued then until you were eight years old it continued up until I was 13 Oh, until you were so, 13. Was school, yes. So I actually left that school where he was the headmaster. I actually left the school when I was about nine. Um, but because we were in the same area, he was then just coming to the home address again, carrying on. He even came to my grandparents one time. Um, and what were the adults the saying? You know, where, were, where was your mother in this whole thing? Mum was... They were right there. Um, how much, how much my mum? It's really hard. I, I still to this day I don't know how much my mum knew or didn't know. Mm. She said that she she's made out she didn't know, but I just I don't I don't know. But then other people around didn't know. Like my grandparents didn't get. Everyone was so charmed by him. Right. It was almost like, you know, as if as if we were privileged that he was coming to the door right. to come and, you know, to come and bring a mu music sheet to her. You know, I, it's almost like, aren't we so lucky? That's, yeah, completely phased. They completely, they are phased. they are masters at disguise yeah. and they're masters at manipulation. Yeah. And um, yeah. was there what what do you feel prohibited you from telling what was happening to you? So I I always had the feeling if I I just knew deep down inside if I told I would I would be killed. So I mm. and I don't know if I don't know if somebody told me that, mm -hmm. but it was so deep rooted in me that that I wouldn't dream I wouldn't have dreamed of telling. Um, but also I. My mum, my mother was extremely difficult. Um, she's uh, just um, she's really hard to describe, but um, not stable, not stable at all. So I felt like as well, it wasn't safe to let her know. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be safe to let her know. She literally would have used it. I feel like she would have used it as one of her, part of her, I don't know, um, just part of her life then and it, I would have been completely disregarded within it it would have been detrimental to me so she was so, a very absorbed in herself and that sort of thing yes <laughs> yeah men, yeah you know and and yeah. I just I ask often where mothers are because I've noticed Juanita that mothers are not it doesn't matter what country you live in if mothers were close to their children these crimes would be stopped, right? Because they'd be talking to you. They'd be involved in yeah. what your daily, you know, often we don't show signs, but we do show some signs, right? I mean, if, if anybody ever asked us the right question, I think we would tell, yeah. do you think if somebody would have asked you? Yeah. If things had been a lot different, then mm -hmm. there would have been a lot different outcome. Yeah. One, not having the words. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, not been spoken about at all. So right. it's, it's, you just don't even I, I remember not even just having no words to put to what was happening um well and, yeah. and that's actually right that's very accurate what you said a child especially at that age that tender age that he started with you we don't have words for that right and nobody gives us yeah. words for that which I think yeah. um part of our discussions 
we want to help people start using those words with their children and saying things that are inappropriate and wrong and to tell. So tell me then, so this, it, this continued to 13 and he even came to your grandparents' home. So what made this abuse stop in your life ultimately? I, to be honest, I don't really know what stopped mm. it. We, we moved again, but we were still in the same area. I don't know if, if I was just getting older and maybe, I really don't know what happens. Mm -hmm. At 11, I remember stopping him, stopping the abuse going so far. So he used to, it's quite a bit graphic, but it's he okay. used to put his um, penis against me. He didn't actually put it in, inserted, he didn't put it inside me, but he put it right up against against my, my vagina. Um, and, I, at 11, I I started my periods mm -hmm. and I was frightened that him doing that because I didn't know mm -hmm. um, would maybe be enough to get me pregnant. And I didn't know. And obviously I couldn't ask anybody. So he came to visit one day and there was nobody else there. I think quite often there was nobody else there. But um, I managed to say no. I was like, no, you know, like you can't do that. And I think he must have, there was no conversation as to what was happening, but I mm -hmm. think he must have known that it was something like that because he didn't push it any further. Um, but then he still kept visiting the home. So still kissing, cuddling, you know, just, yeah, still. And bringing mm -hmm. gifts, still bringing gifts. One of the, so the last thing I remember him bringing me was more chocolate. That was, mm -hmm. but, but why it stopped, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I'm presuming, but maybe you just found the next. Right. Next. Right. So you were, yeah. you were 13 when it stopped then. So how did this affect yeah. you as you now you're 13, you want to start dating and find boys. What did that feel like moving into those years where now you're becoming a, you know, a young woman and want romantic yeah. relationships? It's complicated, isn't it? Yeah, see, and I was actually what happened was then I just fell straight into more abuse. Yeah, talk to so, us about that. Yeah, talk to us about that a little bit. I so, think that's really important. I I did the same thing, Juanita, and I think most yeah. of us do. It's all we know, right? So share a little bit yeah. about what that looked like. So uh, my mother and father had split up. At, my mum and dad had split up at this point. Um, mm -hmm. so mum had a new guy and so we, um, we sort of partly lived with them on and off until mum found somewhere else to live. Um, but so he, the, the new boyfriend abused me, oh. I wanted to say slightly, I wanted to say slightly, you know, we still do these, um, crazy sort of like minimize. Chat. Yeah. Minimize. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but also his son, and I, I still struggle with this because I still feel like it was um, like my love affair. But oh, yes. his son was like 20, 21. And so that's, I was then involved with him. So both the both the the stepfather or, or the boyfriend, your mother's boyfriend and his son. And you know- yeah. I just have to tell you that this is so often the case I, to try to normalize that for you that so many times because we've already been victimized, we fall right back into those roles more often yeah. than not. Actually, it feels like it's almost like I felt like I had this great big scarlet letter that said, abuse me yeah. and abusers yeah. just came and I didn't know how to say no. Yes, there is that as well. Yeah, it was just so difficult that because I still um yeah to me in my mind trying to separate it that you know that actually you know I'm 13 and it's like right but I, I do what I look um when I look back on that as well I feel like that the the son um I feel like he was being groomed as much as and everybody mm. else my mum and the his dad were pushing us together were pushing me and his son together Oh, interesting. So he didn't actually, wasn't actually pursuing me. And that's why I, so I do, I think he was actually being groomed to be an abuser. 
by the parents. So when when you yeah. talk about, I I, I want to go back when you, you tried to minimize what this grown man did to you at 13. Let's go back and talk yeah. about that for a minute. So you don't have to be graphic, but this, you, you wanted to minim, minimize it. Is it for shame that we want to minimize or is it have you shared this a lot? What, I mean, who was this man and what did he do to you? That's it's terrible. You were 13. Yeah, no, I haven't really shared it. No. Um, so, and you know what? This, was, this made me think of my mum more actually, because mm -hmm. she, I remember her being, having a go at me as if I'm a, as if I'm a grown woman and she was jealous of the relationship with, even though she, she's, it's, I don't think she even knew what she didn't know what had happened. It's like she wasn't there. But um, but yeah, she was jealous. She knew that he was obviously, you know, looking at me or whatever, you know, in ways that he shouldn't, instead of just getting us, you know, like being a mum and getting us out of there. She's then actually having to go at me. Wow. Because through jealousy jealous. and that right. And crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And then, and this does show your mother's instability because a mother who has the appropriate love and affection towards a daughter would not see her daughter through eyes of jealousy. It's, it's not, you know, I don't want to talk against your mother, but that's not a normal response from a mother. A mother should not show jealousy, but should show that she wants to protect you. Yeah. And this boyfriend of your mother abuse you only one time or abuse you multiple times as far as I remember he only abused me once see and I did it again I catch myself now though he right. only did it once right did it once. right yes. so so then then his son and so now do they stay in your life for a long time Juanita or did they move on uh they didn't stay in our life for too long no it was all very um and you know what as as time went on so the the son who I still to this day would call my like soul mate weirdly um mm. I want to say weirdly and then I even feel bad when I say that but um he committed suicide years later oh this then, this boy did yeah oh wow yeah when he's there, he, uh, so there was like some, I think there was a seven year age difference between us. So when I'm 13, he was like 20, he came up to 21. Um, but oh, wow. yeah, I don't think he made it to his 30s. And then a few years after that, not that long after that at all, to be honest, um, I reported to the police the first time about abuse that I'd suffered as a child. Because I'm now oh. I was then like maybe 22, 23. And then the father, the guy who had abused me, um, he then committed suicide as well. Oh, oh my goodness. So th this, this was after you reported to the police? Yes. It was so, after I so tell me what, what was going on in your life at 22 that made you determine that the abuse was severe enough and a crime that you were going to turn it in. How did you come to that understanding that it was time to go to the police? I'm trying to think, actually, it was later. I was 20. God, it gets confusing, doesn't it? Um, or it does for me anyway. Yeah, uh, it does for all so, of us. No, it does. Like, well, hang on. So, so he, he committed suicide when I was 22, coming up to 23. And wow. it took me until I was 27 to report. It was through meeting a friend uh, okay. who had been abused himself. And then so having somebody else to talk with who'd actually mm. been through abuse themselves. Yes. Um, and yeah, and just maybe where, just maybe the age I was feeling a bit, well, far more confident than I had been. Um, I decided to go and report. And what and that. what happened? So you go in, you tell the police, and what happens then? Absolutely dire. Um, I wish I could <sighs> say different, but um, so so I reported the headmaster that had abused me. And while I was 
actually in the station giving the statements, another police officer came into the room to tell us that um, to stop everything because the guy that I was reporting to the headmaster had died a fortnight before. Oh, what? Wow. Absolutely devastating. So just, I can't wow. even. Wow. Because on the one hand, it's like, because people go, oh, you know, as if it's, that's a good thing. And it is, but, mm. uh, but at the same time, I felt absolutely robbed, you know, like it's taken me to then to like, be able to come forward to actually get to report him and he's just and he's died on me wow that's just just unbelievable I always feel like it's it felt like a film while I was there um, right. but anyway so the police wouldn't take um they literally stopped the interview there and then for that for him um even though I tried to say that because of his position I wanted the school investigated Right. Um, because I, even though I didn't know of anybody else there, uh, didn't mean that there wasn't anybody else there that might mm -hmm. be another abuser. Um, but yeah, I just felt, yeah, literally that, that because of his position that the school should be looked into. But I don't know if the law was different then. They have changed it since. But, um, but yeah, they wouldn't, they just, they literally just stopped it. It was like, no, there's nothing to report because there's nobody, nobody to prosecute. That's oh, how they looked. Right, right. Did you go to the school at that time and talk to them? No, I've never actually been to the school. I want to go to the school, but I haven't got there yet. Mm. I wanted to have, um, I don't want to just sort of rock up just me. <laughs> it's almost like I need, um, that's why I was hoping, uh, what are these people called again? Loud Fence. I was hoping that Loud Fence might be able to help me um, to approach the school in like a professional manner. Mm -hmm. because I think if I I feel like it needs a little bit of weight behind me or or like um maybe it's some a solicitor or something like that to approach them maybe, mm -hmm. even that feels like too I don't know I don't know the jury's still out on that one as to what I do but I do well, want to do that right you know and and he is gone but uh, you know these institutions needed accountability around that abuse right how many children were in the school with you at that time oh I don't I don't actually know um it's not a very big school because it's a little village but I'd say it's probably I'd say there's at least 100 children mm. we give to right um but he was an old guy so I just think how long he'd been there he was right. so well practiced you can it's a horrible thing to say but you, but you just yeah. No, I've been I, doing that there for two years. So did you uh continuously remember this abuse, Juanita, or did for a time in your life did you kind of put it away through that kind of trauma amnesia denial? Or was it always with you? It was always with me, but certain mm -hmm. bits I even while I was in the interview room trying when I started giving the um my report about him, I had a flash which is the amnesia mm -hmm. we, and I thought how could I even forget that bit he used to, he used to um make me play with his nipples mm. it's just and I'd forgotten that mm -hmm. but that was part of it every time that was part of his thing so and that flashed up to me as I was telling them um about what had happened but yeah no it had gone so for years that had gone but it was right know. and you know people yeah. they they don't understand that until you've lived it our our minds are saturated right and so we we can only take yeah. so much and so how yeah. how did this play out then in your relationships with men or you know as you grew i don't know what the wording would be for it it's it's no it is it's really hard to know what the word for it is it's so difficult mm -hmm. because um sex itself is difficult um feeling like yeah having to having to tell people when when you haven't really told anyone mm -hmm. um yeah boyfriend's probably like one of the first sort of people telling and um yeah, no, just awful. We just, I can't even quite describe it. 
but it's so traumatic trying to tell mm -hmm. it because you're so worried about you don't know how people are going to react you don't know you don't you don't even understand what's happening to yourself mm -hmm. never mind trying to then explain it to somebody else um and then and as I've gone on in my life I find that I've now found looking back it's like everyone virtually I think virtually everyone I've been with has been another abuser mm. and so uh, I'm sorry I I understand I I stayed I'm yeah. al I'm almost 60 but and I'm in a good relationship now but I have to tell you I took 13 years off after my um children's father because he was such an abuser and then I'd get boyfriends that were abusers and what actually got me into counseling was my relationships were such a disaster <laughs> with men yeah bless <laughs> so I can I can relate Juanita I think I think yeah. many, many of us can because you know some of the things that I felt during you know having sex or even just all of that if I was drinking and it felt dirty, I could enjoy it. But when it was supposed to be clean, then I had a hard time with it. Like there was all of this complicated stuff for me around it. Right. I never associated yeah. sex as this clean, beautiful thing. <laughs> I just didn't, yeah. you know, cause I had been, uh, you know, just like you, this, this constant turmoil blocks our ability to see sex as a beautiful thing. Right. Yeah. Which is yeah. unfortunate. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's, those are those lasting effects. Did you get into counseling then at 27 when you went to the police? I, I was having counseling on and off, but I can't remember when that started, but for, yeah, I've been in and out, in and out, in and out um, of counseling. Um, but again, I think, I don't think I was giving them the full story because I was still, I still hadn't, accepted it myself it's like I'm still learning I'm, st I'm still mm -hmm. learning as as to what's even happened to me mm -hmm. so no yeah, and, and so you know it's... I think um I was watching um on unfiltered stories they have a lot of people who have survived in this one lady in the 50s was Miss America and she talked about how her father abused her um, since she was a little girl until she was a teenager. And then she talked about how she had a day person and a night person. And she said, people can't understand how the night person <laughs> you forget about. She said, 13 years of my life were just gone. And, yeah. you know, it is the way that we survive yeah. and it's a beautiful gift at the time. But unfortunately, uh, our being wants to know, it needs to accept who we are and what's happened to us. And so as we get older, that task becomes harder and harder. Is is that how it's feeling for you? You know, to I mean, more of our story starts coming out as we age. It froze again. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's a, you know what it it is. It's okay though. We'll just clip those parts. So, I, did you hear my question? My question to yeah, you was. Yeah. My question to you was, as we get older, it seems that our story wants to be more present in our life. It's harder for us to block the past. That's what I find. Can you talk about that a little bit? So, yes, absolutely. So in the last two years ago, um, I suddenly became conscious of being raped by a cousin but this was not as a child, this was a, as an adult, this was me as an adult. So in reality, it had actually been nine years previous, mm. but just over two years ago, I remembered that. And it absolutely, so I'm, this is where I'm, I'm still at now, where I'm still recovering mm -hmm. from that, because I didn't know that I was, I didn't know that I was suffering from amnesic episodes, Mm -hmm. even though I'd had those flashes they weren't enough for me to but this was just absolutely beyond flooring mm -hmm. decimating is the word I use for it I couldn't carry on life as I as I had been doing the day before it was as as if it had just happened to me there and then because it had because I wasn't right. conscious of it before. right so it and had just at night 
So, and you said though, I had flashes, but I didn't, those flashes weren't enough until then all yeah. of a sudden you have this body, probably memory recall with, with all of the visual. And I understand that. But one of the things I think are so important for us as human beings that have gone through trauma is when we have those flashes, we need to stop and sit with those flashes. But what we do is kind of throw them away. I don't know where that came from. I don't want to see that. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. I can't be real, right? That's vile. Go away from me. Instead yeah. of saying, what is that? Why would my mind bring that to me? It can't manufacture this. Yeah. Where'd it come from? So how, what, what precipitated or triggered then the release of that memory? Can you remember? I... At the time, I thought it was so. I'd started seeing a guy, and I hadn't. I've hardly had any boyfriends and, and partners, to be honest. But um, I started seeing a guy um, who I've known for years, and literally since I was like seventeen. But anyway, so he was a friend of my cousin, and my cousin um, oh. used to do tattooing. And so the boyfriend that I was with for a bit, he's got tattoos on him that my cousin had done, and. I think it was that there was something about mm -hmm. just knowing that my cousin had done those and then this guy touching me. It was, it was just, oh, so yeah. Oh, that so I think did you, did you, straight away. it took, um, it still took a while, but I still think that's, that's what had happened. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's a logical you know, that's logical. So where has your mother come around you and, and help facilitate your healing today? No, no, I have, I have very limited um, contact with her at all. And so, what, and what about your father? Uh, sadly, dad died. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry. 17. So yeah, sadly, dad died. So I'd, um, I'd, told dad about abuse but we never had a conversation about it mm. so I went and told him but it must have just been you, you, a bit like me having the flashback <laughs> it was like must have been so overwhelming for him to be told that right um, he didn't know what to do yeah so he never we never actually had a conversation about we never spoke about it again but I know that he did speak to my sister slightly uh, I'm sure he spoke to my stepmother, but, um, but, but yeah, so it's really, it is sad. It's so sad because he, he's a good dad. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, well, that's, that's so... wonderful. Well, yeah. Tell me, tell me about your sister in this story. Did, did she have any time with or exposure with this headmaster? And did you guys discuss this together? No, so there's a difference. So I've got two sisters and there's a difference in our ages. So as far as I know, they didn't, um, they've both been abused, but they've been abused by different people. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, it's so prevalent, Juanita. They say one in three women and one in six men, but only 20% of people report. So I think those numbers. Yeah fail desperately. I, I just don't think that they're accurate on any level. So do you and your sisters yeah. then help each other through the support and, and, you know, around healing? We, we do. We try to. That's awesome. So, yeah, we do. We try to. Yeah. So boy, the effect of this in your life, I heard you say, I haven't had many boyfriends. So you haven't been married. Do you have children? Yes, yeah, so I was. I, I was married, or I am still married, actually, because he had, he's had <laughs> he's the divorce paper. That's why I'm Miller on here, but I'm Phillips, because Phillips is oh, my okay. maiden name. Okay. So, and on this, that's why I'm Miller on there. But um, uh, so I was actually married for, I think it was something like 18 years. Okay. Like I say, in actual, you know, in legality, we're still married. Um, but um, so when I've, so in this last two years, when I've remembered being raped by my cousin, then I started doing lots of um, work on myself. Um, mm -hmm. I started therapy. I just finding lots of my own stuff as well. Um, and then 
in my healing journey that I've been on, I then realized that my husband that I'd been with, because we were still friends up, up at this point, um, my husband that I'd been with had actually been, was still an abuser, but I'd never recognized it. Mm -hmm. So he had been having, I, I, I still say it like this, and it's like, again, it's like a minimization of it. Um, so I say that he had been having non-consensual sex with me. Um, but be, so because he'd never been violent with me, I was used to violence when I met him. I'd been in a violent relationship before that. And I also had a cousin when I was growing up that was violent with me throughout, um, throughout me being a child and growing up. So because there wasn't any violence with it, I didn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. And I literally right. didn't recognize it until this, this last, well, actually like 18 months. Right. So, I mean, and I understand that because... <laughs> We almost get accustomed to being mistreated and it's all we know. And listening yeah. to you, it sounds like you might have had multiple abusers as at the same time in your childhood, Juanita, if you have this headmaster and then this abusive, aggressive cousin, that's yeah. like you are getting targeted from more than one place. Yeah. So I would, yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, we had a, I had a cousin who's a few years older than me. Um, who'd live with us on and off, on and off. Uh, um, but yeah, very abusive with the violence as well, but sexually abusive. Yeah. But that's a yeah, that's yeah. a lot for a little girl to handle. You're you don't have any safe place to go. No, the well, grandparents were pretty grandparents were safe. So um, oh, that's good. Really, lucky, really lucky to have. And I also had a guy called, he wasn't a real uncle, but I had a guy called Uncle Joe, who, again, literally restored or gave me some, it's not even restored, gave me some um, faith mm -hmm. that they can be good. They're not always like that because, yeah. I love that. So it, it, does, yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. The whole world is like that. Oh, say that again. So, yeah, if I hadn't had these certain people mm -hmm. like him, then you'd actually think, because you're getting bombarded all over, that, um, yeah, I would have thought that the whole world was like that and that all men were like that. Right. It distanced me from my dad because I was so frightened that my dad was going to turn out to be like what appeared, what seemed to me like all the people around, that I literally did, like, yeah distance myself from like hugs with him and stuff and I remember that at quite a young age you know suddenly oh, yes yeah, not liking being tickled and stuff but I mean, yeah he was a good dad you know it's like right but you don't know because you have all this fear of violation yeah, like, yeah literally right. just trying to get away yeah. wow that's that's a heavy childhood <laughs> that you just explained and you know, yeah. our, our minds do want to do this sort of minimization with it because that's a lot. I mean, as I listen to you, you, you just, that's a lot Juanita. And so I, you know, how, that's wonderful that we've, you've moved into healing because life isn't a dress rehearsal, right? This is not, yeah. we don't get to do this again. And so at any point in our life is the right time to start putting ourselves first and saying no more. Yeah. I, I'm no more abuse. I'm not going to tolerate more. So yeah. I like to ask in these situations because um, children are so desperately lonely when we're being abused like that. Like you said, even you pushed your father away. That's it's a desperate lonely state to live in. Where did you see God, if at all in your childhood? I'm I'm so I, I want to say I'm so lucky because I am so lucky um somehow I not that I visually seen him next to me but I felt I I always felt that he was close to me that he was right there with me that's a, a, you know that's a, a, people have different things I I really feel like I 
met him somewhere when I was three before we moved out of this house. And I have to tell you, Juanita, my mom was like, you should know him. We didn't teach you. But I did feel I, I had a terrible childhood and he was always there for me. But I'm always curious to people because without that, it has to be desperately alone, right? And so I love yeah. hearing that, that you did feel that he was with you because doesn't it leave this sort of hope that tomorrow might look better? Yeah, I'd, I'd always, I had this thing that um, I felt like I'd been chosen. Oh, that's I just, beautiful. I literally felt like I'd been chosen by him because, and uh, and I, I I don't even like saying it because it makes me sad. I, I feel like I'm like bigging myself up. Um, but I felt like it, I'd been chosen because I was stronger than the next person. Oh, you mean chosen for abuse so, or chosen for yeah. God to find you? Yeah, chosen for abuse. Oh. chosen for abuse. I literally feel like God had chosen me for abuse it's because yeah literally that and I do the same with my sister because I'm the eldest as well I think I I'm strong you know that, that that's my it's almost like my role that I'd been given this it's almost like my job do you still so, feel but obviously you... now looking I mean maybe I maybe I still do yeah I think I probably still do. Interesting. You know, no um, well, it, it's that martyr. I don't feel bad. I don't feel like, yeah. It doesn't make uh, me feel bad, though. It's just. Well, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I remember leaving my parents' house and I felt like I'd been chosen for a martyr in life. Like if Jesus was born to die, I was born to suffer. That's that's what it felt like to me. I've tried to um, debunk some of those beliefs because I don't think that God wanted me hurt. I don't think that God put me in that family, although I was in that family, you know, and I came through it and I witnessed and had horrible things happen to me. So um, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I want to hope now at my age that God intends for us to have a better life, but I understand exactly what you're talking about. I do understand that because yeah. I, I felt like I was born to be a martyr. I, I couldn't make any other sense out of it when I was a child. Yeah. Yeah. No, do you know, I, was, I was thinking, yeah, I still do feel it because I feel, I feel like I've had to go through all this to get to where I am now so that I can share it with the world. <laughs> and here I am with you talking. Yeah. I mean, I under uh, so, yeah I get that ultimate yeah. he ultimate healing to me is when you get to the place where I don't believe we hit a nirvana where there is no pain in life anymore or we get to this place where we might not have a memory when we're 70 or 80 but I do think that giving back Juanita like what we're doing today I think it is the ultimate place um for trauma survivors and victims to give back and it is a sort of a grander healing, right? That I'm going to take this experience and I'm going to use it for mm -hmm. good. And so in that way, I, I believe 100% that that's a beautiful design for a horrible place that we start in. But I don't know if God, I don't, I, I have a hard time now today believing that God was in the design of me being hurt as a child. My mother actually told me that, that God designs those things. I don't think he does. I think that he can't stop it. This is just my belief that he can't stop yeah. it yet because of human choice. And we all want choice. We love choice. Well, bad people make really bad choices, but I don't think God are in those choices. But anyway, so that's beautiful to hear. I love that. Yeah. I'm I'm so sorry to hear that that your mother isn't beside you. I mean, it makes it hard for us as survivors to not have um, family with us. But so often, if we had great strong parents next to us the abuse probably wouldn't have continued for years and so anyway i just want to acknowledge that and say i'm sorry mom moms and fathers should be next to us and i'm sorry that your dad's gone and that he gave you the love he could but yeah you know it's 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 so much that you have your sisters is a beautiful thing yeah 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 it is so you yeah. so these um these residual effects that are in our life, you know, I, I blog a lot. And one of the blogs I did the other day was when denial can actually become damaging to us in life. In the beginning of our life, um, and all of this stuff is happening to us, denial, I believe, is just this gift 
from ourselves and God to say, you can't handle this right now. But as life moves on to embrace our story is actually where freedom lives. Does that make sense to you? It does. It really does. Fine. But so denial was a gift in our past to survive where we came from. But as we heal and grow, embracing our story is where freedom lives. And I just wondered what that freedom looks like you today in a different form than it looked like in the past. Like you said, you're now getting a divorce and all of those things to me, talk to, talk to me about how that freedom is playing out in your life today. Yeah. So I'm just, I, I feel like I'm in a better place than I've ever been, even though it's been horrendous getting here. I get um, it. Yeah. And I'm still, I'm still struggling so much with um, dissociation. I'm so dissociated. Um, so hence, it was almost like, yeah, yeah, that's why I forget what's just being I said understand. To me. It's like, oh, no. So um, I think it's like I thought of too many things. Uh, so, but yeah, I, um, I just, I feel like I was trying to push all of, even though lots of it I hadn't remembered, didn't even know about it, but I was still pushing all the trauma and everything back down, trying to get on with life, but actually just sort of plodding through. Right. And not really I was surviving that's that's literally what was happening I was surviving but I wasn't really living um so I almost have to it's like I'm sort of glad that everything's happened and I, that I've hit this absolute crescendo with everything um and so yeah I feel freer than I've ever been so I'm just, I feel like I'm just on a mission, but I really am early days on my mission of right. to just keep talking. Just well, and talking. right. I, I want to thank you. Um, that dissociation and all of that, when our memories start coming back, I, I went to counseling pretty heavy for about 20 years. I had to, I mean, I, I witnessed a murder when I was three um, at the hands mm -hmm. of my father and all of these things made it very complicated for me to be in life. I'd go to my job, but I, I couldn't function in relationships with men well. And so I just want to acknowledge and honor that you're here with me and you're talking today. I think it's so important for us to share what the journey looks like. And like you said, I'm on the journey and I'm beginning it in the grandest, broadest way that I have. And it is messy, isn't it? Healing's very messy, <laughs> but it feels it wonderful. It feels good though, doesn't it? Yeah. It really does. It does. I just, I, I can't wait to see where I am this time next year. Yes. But when I'm looking back, to, even when I'm, not, when I'm looking back to where I was three months ago or even six months ago, I'm just, right. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. It's like I'm doing it now. But yeah, there's like, I feel like there's just no turning back. I'm never going to stop talking about the abuse that's happened to me, um, and, and trying to verbalize what it's what it's done to me and yeah and even what I went through so this has been a great challenge for me today again and yeah and just oh and I just want to I just want to give hope to other people that there is life you can we can we can there's better we can do it we can do it we can get through it and I love here that. I am. I feel like I'm living proof that exactly. you can. You know, and the best you can do, it's like it's fine to be. Because I feel like a lot of the time I just don't make any sense. I struggle still to get my words out. I'm like I say, I'm so dissociated. But I'm only just I've only just I've only just realized that. <laughs> it's like, right. So it's like, oh really? <laughs> it, well, and it's you know, it's a beautiful thing. I had someone talk to me the other day about an interview I did and this person said, oh, I found myself so much in her story. She just kind of rambled and went here and there. And you know what? You know why I left that just the way it was? Because millions of us find ourselves in the story of it's a mess, but I'm searching. It doesn't seem logical right now, but I know it's reasonable. All of these things, we know yeah. in our soul that we're going in the right direction, but sometimes it seems like we're in a scurry we're scurrying about and we're not sure where we're going. And that is what healing looks like, right? Yeah. Yeah. It it really, yeah. Like you say, messy. I like that. Because it, it is. It really messy. is messy. 
it's, it's so very messy. Nice. But it feels wonderful. And so we're at time. I just I can't believe that we're actually at an hour. It's I been I know it. Yeah, this I I could go on and talk to you for so long. It's been so beautiful to spend this time with you. I mean that from my heart. Just to sit here with you and, and listen to you. I like to give the last few minutes just back to you, um, to share anything that you feel is important for the person listening. Um, these have just been so beautiful. I use a lot of clips here and there. So I just want to give it back to you, Juanita, and take as much time as you want to just share with the viewer who's listening or watching, because it's on both, uh, what you find important about where you are and what, what is the the message of hope that you want to leave? Oh, if I can, if I can get through it, I would love to um, leave on a poem. Yes, I would love that. I would love that. So you're going to like try and brace myself. Take your time. Um, I want you to take your time. Yeah. Okay. So this is my poem and it's called The Journey. It's very metaphorical, like lots of my little poems, or maybe all of my poems. But um, yeah, so we're going to that's me in my bed because I've got my little bear here I love it I love it <laughs> I love and this it. is another thing that's got me through always not that this this particular bear's been with me maybe he's been with me a long time but but cuddlies little things to cuddle absolutely I get that so the journey so here we go we'll give it a shot so I went on a journey a mountain to climb I know when I get there find peace of mind this path it's not easy it's rocky and steep sometimes I lose footing and fall to my knees past a field full of daisies and my friends the oak trees till I come to a clearing where I can just breathe I carry on upwards with dead ends galore I'm hungry and thirsty and my feet are now sore I push through the tiredness, my struggle, my plight. Just a few steps before me, the end's now in sight. At last, at the summit, what a beautiful view. You can fill in here what fits best for you. I thank everything in me for reaching this scene. I look on in amazement at where I have just been. Then I notice beside me a lovely old shack inside of my ancestors having a chat. They fill me with sarnies and plenty of tea. They give me a gift box that's meant just for me. The day's getting late now. I feel I must go. My essence renewed with a wondrous glow. On the way down, an easier track. Then stretched out before me and welcoming me back. A carpeted meadow of sweet buttercups that I had not noticed when on my way up. When out of the box comes a melodic sound. I'll open it here, now I'm back on home ground. Inside the box was a bird to set free. She gave back the confidence stolen from me. Mm. She's flying to your house, so open the door. She's holding inside her what you're searching for. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's absolutely beautiful. Juanita, we could not close at a better moment in time. Thank you with all of me for being here with us today. That was I'm tearing up. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk thank soon. You for having us. Absolutely. Oh, I'll see you on the next episode of Let's Talk About It. Lovely to speak to you, Jodie. Lovely to speak to you. Bye-bye.